I sometimes read uh, public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. And they were written a long time ago, uh, so they're usually uh, racist or sexist or bigoted. Uh, But in there somewhere and all that is a a story, and that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read uh, works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist, but they might have adult language or adult situations. So that's your warning, uh, but I'm sure you uh, are grown up enough to handle it. Don't write to me complaining. I have two divorce cats. Uh... They are 19 and 20 or 21 years old. Uh, One is Tavy. She's a little black cat that screams and yells all the time and licks your hair while you're sleeping. Uh, The other one's Sixer, who has six toes on the front paws, and he is uh, the oldest and the most sophisticated. Well, the little black cat, Tavy, has been getting sicker and sicker over the last year or so, and now lately she just lays around the house and doesn't move. And um, she's still breathing, but uh, things aren't looking good. I've been bringing her to the vet pretty regularly, and uh, things just aren't getting any better for her. So, the vet's got no real tips, except, uh, you know, who knows what'll happen, she says. And uh, if anything really bad happens, you can bring the cat in and we'll cremate her. So, lately she's just been laying around, and I've been spending a lot of time snuggling her and trying to make her comfortable and warm. Uh, but she's been peeing now is the next thing. She just lays there and pees. So it's been sad and frustrating. But I'm doing my best. Uh, not looking forward to the kids finding out about this. Uh, it's going to be pretty sad around this house. So wish me luck. It's, I have a feeling this is going to be a rough weekend. Even now, she's laying upstairs on my couch where she hasn't moved for hours. And there's a big wet spot around her butt. But I decided to take a break. And come down and read to you. Let's learn a little bit more uh, about the author of Sunshine Sketches of a Little Town, Stephen Leacock. Uh, We learned that he was born in 1869 and died in 1944. Turns out he is a Canadian man. Uh, He immigrated to Canada at the age of six and uh, with his parents. And his fame now rests securely on work begun with the beguiling fantasies of Literary Lapses of 1910 and Nonsense Novels of 1911. Leacock's humor is typically based on a comic perception of social foibles and the incongruity between appearance and reality and human conduct. And his work is characterized by the invention of lively comic situations. Eh, eh, Most renowned are his sunshine sketches of Little Town, which we'll be reading chapter two of, uh, which gently mocks eh, in the fictional town of Mariposa, Ontario, and Arcadian Adventures with the Idle Rich from 1914. So there's another little snippet of information about uh, who wrote what we're reading. So let's dive in. Chapter 2. The Speculations of Jefferson Thorpe It was not until the mining boom, at the time when everybody went simply crazy over cobalt and porcupine mines of the new silver country near Hudson Bay, that Jefferson Thorpe reached what you might call public importance in Mariposa. Of course, everybody knew Jeff and his little barber shop that stood just across the street from Smith's Hotel. Everybody knew him and everybody got shaved there. From early morning, when the commercial travelers off the 630 Express got shaved, into the resemblance of human beings, there were always people going in and out of the barbershop. Mullins, eh, the manager of the exchange bank, took this morning shave from Jeff as a form of resuscitation. All right, with wet enough towels laid on his face to stew him, and with Jeff moving about in the steam, razor in hand as grave as an operating surgeon. Then, as I think I said, Mr. Smith came in every morning 
and there was a tremendous outpouring of Florida waters and rums, Essesses and Reviers and renovators, regardless of expense. What with Jeff's white coat and Mr. Smith's flowered waistcoat and the red geranium in the window and the Florida water and the double extract of high hyacinth, hyacinth, whatever, the little shop seemed multicolored and luxurious enough for the annex of a sultan's harem. But what I mean is that, till the mining boom, Jefferson Thorpe never occupied a position of real prominence in Mariposa. You couldn't, uh, for example, have compared him with a man like um, Galagatha Gingham, who, as undertaker, stood in a direct relation to life and death. Or to Trelawney, the postmaster, who drew money from the federal government of Canada and was regarded as virtually a member of the Dominion cabinet. Everyone knew Jeff and liked him. Eh, but the odd thing was that till he made money, nobody took any stock in his ideas at all. It's only after he made the, quote, cleanup that they came to see what a splendid fellow he was. Level-headed, I think was the term. Indeed, in the speech of Mariposa, the highest form of endowment was to have the head set on horizontally, as with a theodolite. Theodolite. Okay. As I say, it was when Jeff made money uh, that they saw how gifted he was. And when he lost it. But still, there was no need to go into that. I believe it's something the same in other places, too. The barbershop, eh, you will remember, stands across the street from Smith's Hotel. And stares at it face to face. It was one of those wooden structures, I don't know whether you know them, with a false front that sticks up above its real height. And gives it an air, uh, at once rectangular as imposing. It is a form of architecture much used in Mariposa and understood to be in keeping with the pretentious and artificial character of modern business. There is a red, white, and blue post in front of the shop, and the shop itself has a large square window out of proportion for its little flat face. Painted on the panes of the window is the remains of a legend that once spelt BARBERSHOP in all capitals. Executed with the flourishes that prevailed in the golden age of sign painting in Mariposa. Through the window, eh, you can see geraniums in the window shelf, and behind them, Jeff Thorpe, eh, with his little black skull cap on his spectacles drooped up on his nose as he bends forward in the absorption of shaving. As he opens the door, eh, it sets in violent agitation a eh, coiled spring. Up above the bell, it almost rings. Inside, there are two shaving chairs of the heavier electrocution pattern, with mirrors in front of them and pigeonholes with individual shaving mugs. There must be ever so many of them, 15 or 16. It is the current supposition of each of Jeff's customers that everyone else but himself uses a separate mug. One corner of the shop is partitioned off and bears the sign, uh, Hot and Cold Baths, 50 Cents. There has been no bath inside the partition for 20 years, only old newspapers and a mop. Still, it lends distinction somehow, just as do the faded cardboard signs that hang against the mirror, eh, with the legends, Turkish Shampoo, 75 cents, and Roman Massage, one dollar. They said commonly in Mariposa that Jeff made money out of the barbershop. He may have, eh, and it may have been, that turned his mind to investment. But it's hard to see how he could have. A shave cost five cents, and a haircut fifteen, or the two if you liked for a quarter. And at that, uh, it is hard to see how he could make money, even when he had both chairs going and shaved first in one and then the other. You see, in Mariposa, uh, shaving isn't the hurried, perfunctionary thing that is it is in the city. A shave uh, is looked upon as a form of physical pleasure and lasts anywhere from eh, 25 minutes to three quarters of an hour. In the morning hours, perhaps, there's a semblance of haste about it, but in the long quiet of the afternoon, as Jeff leaned forward toward the customer and talked to him in a soft, confidential monotone, like a portrait painter, the razor would go slower and slower, pause and stop and move and pause again till the shave died away into the mere drowse of conversation. At such hours... Yeah, the Mariposa Barbershop had become a very palace of slumber. And as you waited your turn in one of the wooden armchairs beside the wall, with the quiet of the hour and the low drone of Jeff's conversation, the buzzing of the flies against the window pane and the measured tick of the clock above the mirror, your head sank 
dreaming on your breast. And the Mariposa news packet rustled unheeded on the floor. It makes one drowsy uh, just to think of it. Huh? The conversation, of course, uh, was the real charm of the place. You see, Jefferson's forte, or specialty, was information. He could tell you more things within the compass of a half-hour shave than you get in days of laborious research in an encyclopedia. Where he got it all, I don't know, but I'm inclined to think it came more or less out of the newspapers. In the city, eh, people never read the newspapers. Not really. Only little bits and scraps of them, but in Mariposa, it's different. There they read eh, the whole thing from cover to cover, and they built up on it. In the years, eh, a range of acquirement that would put a college president to the blush. Anybody who has ever heard Henry Mullins and Peter Glover talk about the future of China will know just what I mean. And, of course, the peculiarity of Jeff's conversation was that he could suit it eh, to his man every time. He had a kind of divination about it. There was a certain kind of man that Jeff would size up sideways as he stropped the razor, and in whose ear he would whisper, Ah, I see where St. Louis has took four straight games off Chicago. <laughs> and so hold him fascinated to the end. In the same way that he would say to Mr. Smith, I see uh, where it says that this flying squirrel run a dead heat uh, for the king's plate. To a humble intellect like mine, he would explain in full the relations of the Kieser to the German rich dog. But first and foremost, Jeff's specialty in way of conversation was finance and the money market. The huge fortunes uh, that a man with a right kind of head could make. Uh, I've known Jefferson to pause in his shaving with the razor suspended in the air as long as five minutes while he described, uh, with his eye half closed, exactly the kind of head a man needed in order to make a, quote, haul or a, quote, cleanup. It was evidently simply a matter of the head, and as far as one could judge, Jeff's own was the very type required. Uh, I don't know just at what time or how Jefferson first began his speculative enterprises. It was probably uh, in him from the start. There's no doubt that the very idea of such things as traction stock and amalgamated as asbestos <laughs> went to his head, and whenever he spoke of Mr. Carnegie and Mr. Rockefeller, the yearning tone in his voice made it as soft as lathered soap. I suppose the most rudimentary form of this speculation uh, was the hens. Yeah, that was years ago. He kept them out at the back of his house, which itself stood up a grass plot behind and beyond the barbershop. And in the old days, Jeff would say, with a certain note of pride in his voice, that the woman uh, had sold as many as two dozen eggs in a day to the summer visitors. But what with reading about uh, amalgamated asbestos and uh, consolidated copper and all that, uh, the hens began to seem pretty small business, and in any case, the idea of two dozen eggs at a centerpiece almost makes one blush. I suppose a good many of us uh, have felt just as Jeff did about our poor little earnings. Anyway, uh, I remember Jeff telling me one day uh, that he could take the whole lot of the hens and sell them off, uh, crack the money into Chicago wheat on margin, and turn it over in 24 hours. Yeah, he did it, too. Only somehow, when it was turned over, it came upside down on top of the hens. Ha-ha. <laughs> After that, the hen house stood empty, and the woman had to throw away chicken feed every day. At a dead loss of perhaps a shave and a half, but eh, it made no difference to Jeff, for his mind had floated our way already on uh, possibilities of what he called, quote, displacement mining on the Yukon. So you can understand eh, that when the mining boom struck Mariposa, Jefferson Thorpe eh, was in it right from the very start. Why, no wonder it seemed like the finger of Providence. Here was the great silver country spread out north of us where people had thought there was only a wilderness and right at our very doors. You could see, as I saw, the night express going north every evening. For all one knew, Rockefeller or Carnegie or anyone might be on it. For there was great wealth of Calcutta, as the Mariposa news packet put it, poured out at our very feet. So no wonder the town went wild, exclamation point. All day in the street, you could hear men talking of veins and smelters and dips and deposits and faults. 
The town hummed with it like a geology class on examination day, and there were men about the hotels with mining outfits and theodites and dunnage bags, and at Smith's Bar they would hand chunks of rock up and down, some of which would run as high as ten drinks to the pound. Ooh, the fever just caught the town and ran through it, exclamation point. Within a fortnight, yeah, they put a partition down Robertson's coal and wood office and opened the Mariposa Mining Exchange. And just about every man on Main Street started buying a scrip. Then presently, young Fizzlechip, who had been the teller in Mullen's Bank that everybody had thought was a worthless jackass before, came back from the cobalt culture with a fortune yeah, and loafed around in the Mariposa house in English khaki and a horizontal hat, uh, drunk all the time, and everybody holding him up as an example of what was possible if you tried. They all went in, and Jim Elliott mortgaged the inside of the drugstore and jammed it into Twin Tagami. Pete Glover at the hardware store bought Nippua stock at 13 cents and uh, sold it uh, to his brother at 17 and bought it back in less than a week at 19. Uh, they didn't care. Uh, they took a chance. Judge Pepperley put the rest of his wife's money into uh, Temis scamming common. And the lawyer McCartney got the fever too. Ooh, and he put every cent of his sister's possessed into the tulip preferred. And even when young Fizzlechip shot himself in the back room of the Mariposa House, Mr. Gingham buried him in a casket with silver handles, and it was felt that there was a Monte Carlo touch about the whole thing. They all went in, or all except Mr. Smith. You see, Mr. Smith had come down from there, and he knew all about rocks and mining and canoes in the North Country. He knew what it was to eat flour-baked dampers under the lee side of the canoe propped along the underbrush, and to drink the last drop of whiskey within fifty miles. Mr. Smith had mighty little use for the North, but what he did do was to buy up enough uh, early potatoes to send fifteen cartloads lots into cobalt at a profit of five dollars a bag. Mr. Smith, I say, hung back. But Jeff Thorpe was in the mining boom right from the start. He bought in on the Nippewa mine even before the interim prospectus was out. He took a block of a hundred shares of Abity Tibby. Ab- Abity Tibby. Tibby. Okay. <laughs> Development of 14 cents. And he and Johnson, the livery stable keeper next door, formed a syndicate uh, and got a thousand shares of Metagami Lake at three and a quarter cents and then unloaded them on one of the sausage men at Netley's butcher shop at a clear cent per cent advance. Jeff eh, would open the little drawer below the mirror of the barber shop and show you all kinds and sorts of cobalt country mining certificates. Eh, blue ones, eh, pink ones, green ones with outlandish and fascinating names on them. They ran clear from Mattawa to Hudson Bay. And right from the start, he was confident of winning. Eh, quite. Uh, there ain't no difficulty to it, uh, he said. There's lots of silver up there in that country. If you buy some here and some there, you can't fail to come out somewhere, I don't say. He used to continue with the scissors open and ready to cut. There's some of the greenhorns eh, won't get any bit, but if a feller knows the country and eh, keeps a level head, eh, he can't lose. Jefferson had looked at so many prospectuses and so many pictures of mines and pine trees and smelters that I think he'd forgotten that he'd never been in the country. Anyway, uh, what's 200 miles? To an onlooker, it certainly didn't seem so simple. I never knew the meanings of the trickery of the mining business and the sheer obstinate determination of bigger capitalists not to make money when they might till I heard the accounts of Jeff's different mines. Take the case of uh, Corona Jewel. There was a good mind, simply going to ruin for lack of common sense. Eh, she ain't uh, been developed, Jeff would say. There's silver enough in her so you could dig it out with a shovel. She's full of it. Eh, but they won't get at her at worker. Then he'd take a look at the pink and blue certificates of the Corona Jewel and slam the drawer on them in disgust. Worse than that was the silent pine. A clear case of stupid incompetence, utter lack of engineering. Skill was all that was keeping the silent pine from making a fortune for its holders. The only trouble with that mine, said Jeff, is they won't go deep enough. Oh, they followed the vein down to where it kind of thinned out, and then they quit. If they just go right into her good, then they get it again. She's, she's down there all right. 
But perhaps the meanest case of all was the Northern Star. That always seemed to me, every time I heard of it, a straight case uh, for criminal law. The thing was so evidently a conspiracy. I bought her, said Jeff, at 32, and she stayed right there tight, like she was stuck. Then a bunch of these fellers in the city started to drive her down, and they got her pushed down to 24. And I held on to her, and they shoved her down to 21. This morning, they've got her down to 16, but I don't mean to let go, no sir. In another fortnight, they shoved her, the same unscrupulous crowd, down to nine cents. And Jefferson still held on. Ah, they are working her down, he admitted, but I'm holding her. No conflict between vice and virtue was ever grimmer. She's at six, said Jeff, but I got her. Ah, they can't squeeze me. A few days after that, the same criminal gang had her down further than ever. They got her down to three cents, said Jeff, but I'm with her. Yes, sir. They think they can shove her clean off the market, but they can't do it. I've bought in on Johnson's shares and the whole of Netley's, and I'll stay with her till she breaks. So they shoved and pushed and clawed and heard down that unseen nefarious crowd in the city, and Jeff held on to her as if they writhed and twisted at his grip. And then, and then, well, that's just the queer thing about the mining business. Why, sudden as a flash of lightning, it seemed, the news came over the wire to the Mariposa news packet that they had struck a vein of silver in the Northern Star as thick as a sidewalk, and that the stock had jumped to $17 a share. And even at that, you couldn't get it, and Jeff stood there, flushed and half-staggered against the mirror of the little shop, with a bunch of mining scrip in his hands, and it's worth $40,000. Excitement! Exclamation point. Is all over the town in minutes. They ran off news extra at the Mariposa news packet, and in less than no time, there wasn't standing room in the barber shop. And over in the Smith's Hotel, they had three extra barkeepers working on the lager beer pumps. They were selling mining shares on the main street in Mariposa that afternoon, and people were just clutching for them. Then at night... Uh, there was a big oyster supper in Smith's Calf and speeches and Mariposa Band outside. And the queer thing was that the very next afternoon was the funeral of young uh, Fizzle Chip. And Dean Drone had to change the whole text of his Sunday sermon at two days' notice for fear of offending public sentiment. But I think that Jeff uh, liked best of it was all the sort of public recognition that it meant. He'd stand there in the shop, hardly bothering to shave, and explain uh, to the men in the armchairs how he held her. Oh, and how they shoved her and clung to her, and you know, what he said to himself, the perfect Iliad, while he was clinging to her. The whole thing was in the city papers for a few days after, with a photograph of Jeff taken uh, specifically at Ed Moore's studio upstairs from Netley's. It showed Jeff sitting among palm trees, as all mining men do, with one hand on his knee and a dog, uh, one of those regular mining dogs at his feet, and a look of piercing intelligence in his face uh, that would easily account for $40,000. I say that the recognition meant a lot to Jeff, uh, for its own sake. But no doubt the fortune meant quite a bit to him, too, on the account of Mira. Did I mention Mira? Uh, Jeff's daughter? Uh, perhaps not. That's the trouble with the people of Mariposa. They're all so separate and so different. Not a bit like the people in the cities, uh, that unless you hear about them separately and one by one, you can't for a moment understand what they're like. Mira had golden hair and a Greek face, uh, which would come bursting through the barbershop in a hat at least six inches wider than what they wear in uh, Paris. As you saw her swinging up the street to the telephone exchange in a suit, that was straight out of the delineator in brown American boots. There was a style written all over her. The kind of thing the Mariposa recognized and did homage to. And to see her in the exchange. She was one of the four girls that I spoke of on her high stool with a steel cap on, jabbing and connecting plugs in and out as if electricity cost nothing. Well, all I mean is that you could understand why it was that the commercial travelers would stand around in the exchange calling up all sorts of impossible villages and whiting about so pleasant and genial. It made one realize how naturally good-tempered men are, and when Mira could go off duty and Mrs. Cleghorn, who was sallow, would come on, and eh, the commercial men would be off again like autumn leaves. It just shows the difference between people. There was Mira, who treated lovers like dogs, who would slap them across the face with a banana skin to show her utter independence. And then there was uh, uh, Mrs. Cleghorn, 
who was sallow, and who bought a 40 cent ancient history to improve herself. And yet, as if she'd hit any man in Mariposa with a banana skin, he'd have her arrested for assault. Mind you, I don't mean that Mira was merely flippant and worthless. Not at all. She was a girl with any amount of talent. You could have heard her recite The Raven at Methodist Social. Simply genius. And when she acted Portia in the trial scene of The Merchant of Venice at the high school concert, everyone in Mariposa admitted that you couldn't have told it from the original. So, of course, as soon as Jeff made the fortune, Mira had her resignation in the next morning, and everyone knew that she was to go to dramatic school for three months in the fall and become a leading actress. But as I said, uh, the public recognition counted a lot for Jeff. The moment you begin to get that sort of thing, it comes in quickly enough. Brains, you know, are recognized right away. That was why, of course, within a week from this, Jeff received the first big packet of stuff from the Cuban Land Development Company with colored pictures of Cuba and fields of bananas and haciendas and insurrectos with machetes and heaven knows what. Ah, they heard of him somehow. It wasn't for a modest man like Jefferson to say how. After all, the capitalists of the world are just one in the same crowd. If you're in it, I hear in it. That's all. Jeff realized why it is, of course, men like Carnegie and Rockefeller and Morgan all know one another. They have to. For all I know, this Cuban stuff may have been sent from Morgan himself. Some of the people in Mariposa said yes, others said no. There was no certainty. Anyway, they were fair and straight, this Cuban crowd that wrote to Jeff. They offered him to come right in and be one of themselves. If a man's got the brains, you may as well recognize it straight away. Just as well write him to be a director now as to wait and hesitate till he forces his way into it. Anyhow, nah, they didn't hesitate. These Cuban people that wrote to Jeff from Cuba, (laughs) or from the post office box in New York, it's all the same thing. Because Cuba, being so near to New York, the mail is all distributed from there. I suppose, some financial circles, they might have been slower wanted guarantees of some sort and so on, but these Cubans, eh, you know, have got a sort of Spanish warmth of heart that you don't see in businessmen in America and that touches you. No, they ask no guarantee. Just send the money wherever by express or by bank draft or check and they left entirety to oneself as a matter between Cuban gentlemen. And they were quite frank about their enterprise. Bananas and tobacco in the plantation district reclaimed from the insurrectos. You can see it all there in the pictures. Tobacco plants uh, and the insurrectos. Everything. And they made no rash promises. Just admitted straight out that the enterprise might uh, realize 400% or might conceivably make less. There's no hint of more. Uh, so within a month, everyone in Mariposa knew that Jeff Thorpe was in Cuban lands. Ed would probably clean up half a million by New Year's. You wouldn't have failed to know it. All around the little shop, there were pictures of banana groves in the harbor of Habana and the Cubans in white suits and scarlet sashes smoking ah, cigarettes in the sun and too ignorant to know that you can make 400% by planting a banana tree. I liked it about Jeff that he didn't stop shaving. He went on just the same. Even when Johnson, the livery stableman, came in with $500 and asked to see if a, the Cuban board of directors would let him put in. Jeff laid it on the drawer and then shaved him for five cents in the same old way. Of course, he must have felt proud when, a few days later, he got a letter from the Cuban people from New York accepting the money straight off without a single question and without knowing anything more of Johnson except that he was a friend of Jeff's. They wrote most handsomely. Any of friends of Jeff's were friends of Cuba. All money they might send would be treated just as Jeff's would be treated. One reason, perhaps, why Jeff didn't give up shaving is because it allowed him to talk about Cuba. You see, everyone knew in Mariposa that Jeff Thorpe had sold out of cobalts and had gone into Cuban revenated lands. And that spread around him a kind of halo of wealth and mystery and outlandishness. Oh, something Spanish. Perhaps you've felt it about people that you know. Anyhow, they asked him about the climate and the yellow fever and what the, ooh, Negroes were like and all that sort of thing. This Cuby, it appears, is an island, Jeff would explain. Uh, Of course, everybody knows how easily islands lend themselves to making money. And for fruit, they say it comes up so fast you can't stop it. 
and then he would pass into details about the hash enders and the resurrectos and technical things like that till it was thought a wonder how he could know it still. It was realized that a man with money has got to know these things. Yeah, like a Morgan and Rockefeller and all these men that make a pile. They know just as much as Jeff did about the countries where they make it. It stands to reason. Uh, did I say that Jeff shaved in the same old way? Yeah, not quite. There was something even dreamier about it now, and a sort of new element in the way that Jeff fell out of his monotone into lapses of thought, that I, for one, misunderstood. I thought that perhaps getting so much money, well, you know the way it acts on people in larger cities, it seemed to spoil one's idea of Jeff, that copper and asbestos and banana lands should form the goal of this thought, when, if he knew it, the little shop and the sunlight of Mariposa was so much better. In fact... I had perhaps borne him a grudge for what seemed to me his perpetual interest in the great capitalists. He always had some item out of the paper about them. I see where this here Carnegie has given $50,000 for one of those observatories, he would say. And another day he would pause in the course of shaving and almost whisper, Did you ever see this Rockefeller? It was only... By a sort of accident that I came to know that there was another side of Jefferson's speculation that no one in Mariposa ever knew, or will ever know now. I knew it because I went in to see Jeff in his house one night. The house, I think I said it, stood out behind the barbershop. You went out back of uh, the door to the shop and through a grass plot with petunias beside it, and the house stood at the end. You could see the light of the lamp behind the blind and through the screen door as you came along, and it was... Here that Jefferson used to sit in the evenings when the shop got empty. There was a round table that the woman used to lay for supper, and after supper there used to be a checkered cloth on it with a lamp and a shade. And beside it, Jeff would sit with his spectacles on and the paper spread out, reading about Carnegie and Rockefeller. Near him, but away from the table, was the woman doing needlework. And Mira, uh, when she wasn't working in the telephone exchange was there, too, with her elbows on the table, reading Mary Corelli. Only now, of course, after the fortune, she was reading the prospectus of dramatic schools. So this night, I don't know just what it was in the paper that caused it, Jeff laid down what he was reading and started to talk about Carnegie. Ah, this Carnegie, I bet you, would be worth, said Jeff, closing his eyes in calculation, eh, as much as perhaps two million dollars if you were to sell him up. And this Rockefeller and his Morgan, either of them, to sell them up clean would be worth another couple million. I may say, in parentheses, that it was a favorite method in Mariposa if you wanted to get a, at the real worth of a man to imagine him clean sold up, put up for auction, as it were. It was the only way to test him. And now look at him, Jeff went on. They make their money, and what do they do with it? They give it away. And who do they give it to? Why... To those who don't want it, every time. They give it to those professors and to those who do research and that. And and do the poor get any of it? Nah, not a cent and never will. I tell you, boys, Jeff continued. There were no boys present, but in Mariposa, all really important speeches were addressed to an imaginary imaginary audience of boys. I tell you, if I was to make a million out of this uh, QB, I'd give it straight to the poor. Yes, sir, divide it up into a hundred lots of a thousand dollars each and give it to the people that hadn't nothing. So always after that, I knew just what the bananas were being grown for. Indeed, after that, though, Jefferson never spoke of his intentions directly. He said a number of things that seemed to bear on them. He asked me, for instance, one day, how many blind people would it take to fill one of these blind homes and how a feller could get a hold of them. Another time, he asked whether if a feller advertised for some of these incurables, a feller would get enough of them to make a showing. I know for a fact uh, that he got Nivens, the lawyer, to draw up a document. He was to give an acre of banana land in Cuba to every idiot in Missabana County. But still, uh, what's the use of talking of what Jeff meant to do? Nobody knows or cares about it now. The end of it was bound to come. Even in Mariposa, some of the people must have thought so. Else how was it that Henry Mullins made such a fuss about selling a draft for 40000 on New York? And why was it that Mr. Smith uh, wouldn't pay Billy, the desk clerk, his back wages when he wanted to put it into Cuba? Oh, yes, some of them must have seen it. 
And yet when it came, it seemed so quiet, ever so quiet. Not a bit like the Northern Star Mine and the Oyster Supper and the Mariposa Band. It was strange how quiet these things looked the other way around. You remember the Cuban land frauds in New York and Porforio Gomez shooting the detective and him and Maximo Morez getting clear away with 200,000? No, of course you don't. Why, even in the city papers, it only filled an inch or two of type. And anyway, the names were hard to remember. That was Jeff's money, part of it. Mullins got the telegram from a broker or someone and showed it to Jeff just as he was going up the street with an estate agent to look at a big empty lot on the hill behind the town. The very place for these incurables. And Jeff went back to the shop. So quiet. Have you ever seen an animal that's stricken through how quiet it seems to move? Well, that's how he walked. And since that, eh, though it's quite a little while ago, the shop's open till 11 every night now, and Jeff is shaving away to pay back that 500 that Johnson, the livery man, sent to the Cubans, and pathetic? Ah, tut, tut. You don't know, Mariposa. Jeff has to work pretty late. But that's nothing, nothing at all. If you've worked hard all your lifetime and Mira's back at the telephone exchange, they were glad enough to get her. And she says now that if there's one thing she hates... It's the stage, and she can't see how the actresses put up with it. Anyway, things are not so bad. You see it just as it is at the time that Mr. Smith's calf opened, and Mr. Smith came to Jeff's woman and said he wanted seven dozen eggs a day. They wanted them handy. And so the hens are back, and more of them, and they exalt so every morning over the eggs. They lay that if you wanted to talk of Rockefeller in the barbershop, you couldn't hear his name for the cackling. Hey, I remember Garrison Keeler? I do. I grew up in Minnesota in the 70s and 80s, and that guy was everywhere. He was on uh, Minnesota Public Radio doing his Prairie Home Companion, which was filled to the brim with quaint prairie music that I would never want to listen to in my free time, and you would basically have to sit through it to get to the one segment where he would tell his stories about Lake Wobegon. And uh, my dad loved that show, and I liked my dad, so I'd listen through all that horrible music and weird little skits until finally you got to Lake Wobegon. And I like those stories uh, about quirky little people in a made-up small town and uh, weird little kind of romantic sort of nostalgic sort of stories and had little morals at the end. And it was good. It kind of took off too much. You kept seeing his weird bulldog-looking face on the covers of magazines and books in the bookstores, and he was just everywhere. Kind of got annoying after a while. And uh, that face with those weird diabolical eyebrows of his, those big jowls, uh, made sense when you found out later that he's like molesting people and got fired. So my point is, I think I know where he got his ideas from Stephen Leacock, wrote this story long before Lake Wobegon was ever thought up. Uh, the moral of this story, uh, I think it's leave wealth to the wealthy. Yeah, if you're not a rich person already, don't go trying to be rich. It's not going to work out for you. Just uh, stay poor and humble. I think that's the moral to this story. Oh, you'll fall into a lot of money, but you're too dumb to hold on to it. You're going to wind up giving it to Cubans. And uh, you want to spend it on things like, ugh, gross, the poor and uh, the people who are needy. So I think uh, this is a good place to wrap up. I've got a, uh, the healthy cat has been upstairs meowing at me during this whole recording, which makes me terrified that it's trying to alert me to something horrible with the unhealthy cat. So I should get going. So I'll be back next week with chapter three. Thanks for listening.